the Nebraska ETV Network, and the Great Amwell Company, in association with WNET 13, offer a special presentation in the humanities. Made possible by grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, John Deere Company, Exxon Corporation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. Hello. I'm Kurt Vonnegut, and I'm standing on a bluff about 10 miles south of Hannibal, Missouri. The great Mississippi, Mark Twain called this river, the majestic, the magnificent Mississippi, rolling its mile-wide tide along and shining in the sun. He grew up along the river for four years. As a cub or apprentice and then as a licensed pilot, he stood at the wheel of steamboats that plied the 12 or 1,300 miles of the lower Mississippi between St. Louis and New Orleans. When the Civil War broke out, the river was closed to commercial traffic, so his occupation was gone. But the pride and challenge of piloting would remain with him for the rest of his life. Samuel L. Clements became the writer Mark Twain. He took his pen name from the river, from the leadsman's cry meaning two fathoms or 12 feet of water, safe sailing for a steamboat of that day. As an older man, Twain would have nightmares, which he said took the form of running into an overshadowing bluff in a steamboat. But he also daydreamed of returning to the river one day, not as a world-famous writer, but as master pilot of the Mississippi. So life on the Mississippi touches the heart of the experience of Mark Twain, but it isn't autobiography any more than his classic novels of the river, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn are autobiography. Mark Twain was a great imaginative writer. He said that he wanted to recapture old Mississippi days of steamboating glory and grandeur as seen from the pilot house. And he transformed remembered experience into an independent reality that after more than a century is as compelling as it was on the day that he sat down to write Life on the Mississippi.
Take it. Uh, you're bronking over there. Mr. Bixby? Uh, Mr. Bixby, can I speak to you? Uh, Mr. Bixby? Well, the captain said it'd be all right. <laughs> if it was all right with you, he said. Uh, he said that you didn't have a steersman. He did, did he? How would you like to learn a young man the river? I wouldn't. Well, you see... I, I said I wouldn't. What I meant was apprentices, leading on to license. Yeah, I figured that. Boy, they had a tad work to go on. I don't think the pilot and they're just standing there and being admired by the ladies, wearing a gold watch and tapping on a big bell. Well, there's more to it than that. There's a heap more. I expect there is. You do, huh? How do you feel about sudden death? Huh? I can't say I favor it. Why? You know how long a boat lasts on this river, son? Five years, sometimes only four. The collisions, explosions. There are 14 ways of killing a steamboat and everyone on her. The pilot has no job for Miss Nancy, no, sir. It's be almighty terrifying. Now, you got the sand for that? I hope so. Well, I hope so, and thanks to it, got no place on the river. No, so is the only coin we deal in. Appears to me you're right sure on that. Mr. 
Sister Bixby, I'll pay for the learning. I got $100 set aside cash money. I can pay... Clamp your teeth on a thing. You just sort of. You see, it's just that I've always found that cubs are more trouble than they're worth. Now, in the lump, that is. Now, the individual article, he'd. Well, he'd have to come mighty high recommended. Do you know the Bowen boys? Pilots off the St. Louis and New Orleans trade? Bowen boys. I guess I do. Will Bowen did his first steering under me. Mighty good boy, too. First come aboard, he had a testament with him. In a week's time, he had swapped that for a pack of cards. They were schoolmates of mine. Will's one of my chums. No, he was. Nicely, Mr. Grogan. Mr. Ela. You ever done any steering, boy? I was raised on the river in Hannibal. Steered everything floatable except a steamboat. Reckon I can get hold of that. Well, once I learn the art of it, that is. What's your name, sir? Sam, sir. Do you drink? No. Do you gamble? No. In fact, I could learn. <laughs> Do you swear? Not for amusement, only under pressure. Do you tell the truth? I mean, what it's put to you. You mean, do I lie? No, sir. Well, now and again, I tell whoppers when I'm behind it. Well, Bixby is your man. That gentleman is Mr. Ela. He's our other pilot. From heart of very heart, great Hector Welcome. The goldsmith, Mr. Ela. Shakespeare, Mr. Bixby. And this skeezix here, George Ritchie. He's my steersman. I watch below, boy. Where are you bunking? Uh, down near the boiler. You got a Texas cabin now. Move your traps up later. Glad you're with us. Come over here by me, boy. All right, now that's 12 mile point just behind us. We stay inside until we come up on Sheep Nose Point. That's her up ahead. Right here is when we start our crossing. Starts to shoal here. If it gets so shallow, a man can wade across and hardly wet his shirt tail. The reef runs straight across to that stand of willows on the starboard side. See that place right there where them ripples kind of flatten out a little bit right there? Yeah. All right, that's the break in the reef. That should give us enough water. Seven and a half feet. Seven and a half feet. All right. All right, the 
where she is. She's starting to smell out the channel. Sam, what are you doing? Come on, Sam, turn out. Up to the wheelhouse. In the middle of the night? No, it ain't. It's past four, and it's your watch again. Ain't that new cop turned out yet? Huh. My, won't he get jawed on? Lordy, Rich, I ain't had but four hours sleep. How likely he's delicate. Give him some sugar in a rag and send for the chambermaid to sing him rock a -bye, baby. <laughs> I thought Steamer was tied up for the night anyway. Some do. That's up to the pilot. Big's been healing now. Midnight's as good as daylight to them. They ain't got a moon to steer by. They use lightning bugs. This is the name of the first point above Harrison's Landing. I don't know. You don't know? That's right, you know? Oh, no use to the smart one, aren't you? The name of the second point. I don't know. It could beat anything. Tell me the name of any point or place that I have told you. Don't rightly think I can. Now look here, what, what do you start out from to cross over just above Spanish Rock? I don't know. What? I can't hear you, what? You don't know? You, 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 you don't know? Well, what do you know? Nothing for certain. By great Caesar's ghost, I believe you, you are the stupidest dunderhead I ever saw or ever heard of. But the idea of you being a pilot, why, you, you, you don't know enough to pilot a cow down the damn lane. All right, boy, now what, why do you think I told you the names of those points? 
Be entertaining, I thought. Entertaining? Well, now, what in the name of Jesse made you think that? What, you think you up in this pilot house to learn comical songs and sayings? How to do diddly jigs? No, my dog, you're here to learn the river. And that's for years, boy, the Mississippi. 1,200 miles of them. The whole way is paving stone with the bones of dead steamboats and the reputations of Dunderhead pilots. No mile more down there, boy. You best know where you are and where you're going. Let's be... I'll see him get away from me. slow, Mr. Grogan. What are you doing on that shingle, you bunch of knob-headed pigs? I gotta cut you into stoneboard. Short half, too, and save you from going on shore and being hung. You blasted, pinball-headed punks and rollers. I had a whole yard boat and kick your tripes out for tracing up a river. Hey, you know, I know, man. Hey, Wally, you clay-eating, toad-faced pukes. What you must do, my boy? a little memorandum book. Every time I tell you things, you write it down. There's only one way to become a pilot, and that is to learn this river by heart. To know it. The way you know your ABC. Uh, half speed, uh, half slow, Mr. Grogan, please. Now, this will make it 18 chords. All beach and chestnut, mind you. And free of knots. And none of your green trash wood like last time. Deal? All right! Get that wood aboard now! Finally, finally! Indian Rock to head of Island 62. When bar is covered, there's port or less to and shoot. Shape bar till head of towhead and main point open, and then hold open the right of high trees. Hey, what you doing on the guards? I thought it was private. We'll be wooden up for another half hour. Eli and Bixby's having fits, what with the three hours lost getting mud out of the violet this morning. Here. <laughs> I swear, you are a nickel-plated wonder. There's the whole river. I bet there ain't a bend or a bar a fella could name that isn't written down there. In the book, yeah. If only it was in my head. All the way up from 400 miles down, I can't hardly remember any of it. That's only half the river anyway. Every time I was off watch or sleep, every four hours a blank page, this radio... Hey, looky there! We got company coming. Queer place to be taking on passengers? Could be they ain't. Least we is not paying passengers. Look to me like river inspectors. What's that? Out of work pilots. Likely going down to Memphis to get new berths. Owners let them ride free of charge. Of course, they're expected to help out in the case of a pinch, but mostly they just eat and loaf and pretend like they're inspecting the river and keeping up with changes and useful stuff like that. That one with the spectacles, Mr. Thornburn, little fella next to him, that'd be Mr. Leathers. That one I know. That's old Brown. Good enough pilot, I reckon, but mean. Meaner than snakes. Mr. Bixby, at your convenience. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Find a good stage of water below Plum Point, Bixby. 
false point, she's Mark Twain. Colonel S. Twain at the second read. Don't want to find fault with your lead man, Mr. Leathers, but I found a good deal less than that coming up. <laughs> You're drawing too much to get over that second read. Mark my words. You both! What are you gawking at? Uh, miss? N nothing. Where'd you get them shoes? Sir? What you got on them? Goose grease. Looks like frog spit. All right, then. Going past five o'clock, Mr. Bixby. It is indeed, sir. There'll be no moon tonight. If we don't make Hat Island by dark, we're going to have to tie up someplace till morning. Oh, I am deeply sensible of that. How do you propose to make up the time, Mr. Bixby? By push and enterprise. By push and enterprise. What's the shape of Walnut Bend? What's that? Walnut Bend. What's the shape of it? The truth is, I didn't know it had any particular shape. Well, oh, no, great suffering, Hannah, if you aren't too much by a single degree. The shape of the river's the whole thing. I take it, you by and large, boy, you do seem to be more different kinds of an ass than any creature I ever saw or heard of. Now, the shape of the river's got to be learnt. No getting around that. Because she never looks the same, you see. Well, if it never looks the same, then how am I ever going to learn it? Well, now, how do you follow a hallway at home in the dark? You learn the shape of it. So you steer through that hallway by the shape that's in your head. Never mind the one that's before your eyes. My front hallway's the same shape coming in, doors are going out. Upstream and downstream now could be two different rivers. Four. It's a different day and night, too. If you take that shoreline there, now it's straight as a deck rail, you can see. But a starlight night will change that to where you'd claw away from every bunch of timber because you could take the black shadow of it for a solid cable. Now look, here, you see that hill yonder? As long as that's only one hill, I can go booming along here the way I'm going. But the minute that, that splits at the top and starts to form a V, I know I've got to scratch to starboard in a hurry, or I'll bang this boat's brains out against a rock. And when the two prongs... You hear that? You mark that dog's voice. You hear that on a dark night, and you know you're passing Selby Plantation. That being so, what's your next crossing? Hole in the wall, half mile up. All right. What was your deepest water at middle crossing at Hole in the Wall time before last? Not, not, no, not, not in there, in there. Expect a body to remember that. That? And the exact spot where this boat lay in shoreless water and 500 other places. But they keep changing. That's right. Jiminy. What you doing down here? I've been relieved, that's what. Uh, Mr. Bixby's got Ela steering for him. Those river inspectors are perched up there like pullets in a hen house. Half the time they're ciphering ways of getting to Memphis by morning, the rest of the time how there ain't no mortal way of doing it. 
What's so dangerous about this Hat Island crossing? You can have no trouble coming up. It's easy as butter. Down river's a heap different. And that was broad daylight. When we come boiling over these reefs with the current pushing us, they're dog tooth gravel, like to chew the bottom out of us. True fact. Not only that, them's blind reefs. You can't even see them when it's sun shining. Pilot's not only got to cross them, he got to shave the head of the island, close enough to squish turtles. And all the time, there's snags, planters, and sawyers and such just down him to get that close. Gets worse. There's old General Taylor just waiting for us. Who's he? Ain't a he. It's a her. Wrecked steamboat got sunk making the same crossing back a year, so just underwater and itching to pull another boat down with her. And guess who her pilot was? Who? Old Brown, that's who. Knew it! Stayed aboard that dodd carriage, be halfway to Memphis, but now. Oh, no moon. Now your stars is all gone. Like it in the stove's lid out there, Horace. Can't tell sky from river. And young just had island. And we can't make it. No earthly way. Too bad, Horace. We just got here a half hour earlier. <laughs> Knew it all along. Landon Bell. He's tying up. He's not landing. He rung for the Landman! It's cute. Sorry. Sorry.
first free for right. That was done beautiful. Beautiful. Over that one, anyway. Wait. There's another one. Stand by now. Foot to starboard, Mr. Mothers. Shadow of death, but he's a lightning pilot. Just pull it down from that there greasy water. He's her over the fairground. Those fairs foul. And foul despair. And a little water clears us of this deed. Mr. Ealer, larboard side. We have a hail for a landing. We've got a hail, sir. Great Caesar, hail! Hail, Fane of Carter! Bid the merry bells ring to thine ear. Yes, sir. Hail to the house of Capulet! No, sir. I, I think it's Harrison's farm. <sighs> Strawberry? Well, I reckon. Who do you think steers it? Pilot? You too, mister? My, I'm proud to know you. Him and me, we're gonna be pots as soon as we get big enough growth. Me too. Well, I don't know. You got to go through the degrees first. Why, there's all sorts of things you have to learn before you can even cub secret stuff. What kind of secret stuff? <clears throat> well, let me see now. There's, there's how to, uh... Uh, partner? Well, now, first off, you got to be able to tell where you are anywhere on the river on a dark night just by tasting the water. 
same ways you reckon how wide the river is by listening to the echo of your wheel walk. Most important of all, though, is catfish eating. I never heard of that. What is it? Well, now, that's when you put bait on your lead line and you fish for your soundings. So you heave in a catfish. You count the number of scales right between the eyes, multiply it by seven, give you how deep the water is every time. Except uh, below Baton Rouge, for some reason down there you got to allow a quarter less. And it must be a catfish too. You go count the scales and a pike or an eel, you get your boat piled up sure as thunder. Mr. Richie, I think we better start heading back before the captain starts fretting. Yes, sir. And now, fellas, next boat comes by here. I want you to ask the pilot how to do all those things I told you. Only don't you let on where you heard it from, because they don't favor us giving away secrets of the trade like that. Why didn't you tell me you could stretch like that? Lordy, you got her down to a feather edge. Right providential you're putting in here, brother. I'm headed for LaGrange. By any chance you land in there? I reckon I can talk to the captain about it. Why don't you just arrange passage with my clerk? Mighty grateful, brother. You have delivered me out of the wilderness. Well, I'd do it for anybody, sir. <laughs> Hey, Mayor, are you certain? I took her for a speck of ruin, but that's just red dust. Underneath, she's all over gray. Well, don't tell the men. We already know. And they're already threatening to skedaddle at the next landing. Ain't a blasted one of them will stay in the same boat with the gray man. That ain't nothing but what I just heard now. That passenger we took aboard along with the gray man, she's a preacher. He told me so himself. How could this happen, sir? Well, I, I don't know. He, he was a real fancy talker. I, I took him for a gambler. What's all this fussing about a gray man and a preacher? One's a hoodoo and the other's a Jonah, that's what. It's like nobody will ship on a boat with six letters in a name or one carrying a white cat. There's only two things brings the devil's luck worse than that, and danged if we ain't got them both. Well, what's to be done, then? There's a committee working on it now. Here's your passage money, Mac. What's that for, brother? Well, you see, ain't none of us ever see a genuine heel-kicking, hat-floating, wide river baptism, and we're prepared to pay for the entertainment. <laughs> She's way freighted to a farmer at Mill Point. If she's not delivered, the company's gonna get lawsuits. And if we don't cross her overboard, we got us a mutiny. Now look at that! Thank you, Pixie's company ain't gone and solved the whole dang thing. Ooh, we he ain't painted that horse for another go. Take it, young sir, that you know how to run the next few miles without landing our spang in the middle of Arkansas. I reckon I got it down pretty fine. I take it inside that first nag above that point there, and then outside the next one. Say, that really looks like a reef over there. Well, might could be. But where do you start the crossing from? Uh, lower end of Higgins Woodyard, but that. That couldn't be a bluff where he could. I mean, it wasn't there coming down. I didn't have the watch coming down, so, so as it could be, and I wouldn't know. Uh, I don't see a break in it. Mr. Bixby, I'd take it right of kindly if, if you'd take it from... Mr. Bixby? Mr. Bixby? Oh, Lordy, I'm nearly on it.
business is going on up there? The reef has moved. Come ahead on it. Order for the bar. You know, boy, when you get a hail from shore, you ought to tap the big bell before you land to let the engineers know what you're doing. Didn't have a hail. Oh. Well, it was wood then. Well, now the officer of the watch will let you know when he wants to do it up. Didn't need wood. Well, then what are you doing up here in the bend? Did you ever know of a boat to follow a bend? Upstream at this stage of the river. No, sir. I wasn't trying to follow it. I was trying to get away from a bluff reef. No. No, it wasn't a bluff reef. There isn't one within three miles of where you are. But I saw it. It's as bluff as that one there. Just about. Run over. You give that as an order? I give it as an order, yes. Run over it. If I don't, I wish I may die. All right, I'll take the responsibility. There, now, don't you see the difference? That wasn't anything but a wind reef. The wind does that right there. But it looks exactly like a bluff reef. Well, how am I ever supposed to tell them apart? I can't tell you that. It's an instinct. By and by, you'll just naturally know one from the other, but you'll, you'll never be able to explain to anyone how or why you know it. Well, when I get so as I know that, then I should be able to raise the dead, and then I won't need to pilot a steamboat to make a living. I want to retire from this business. I need a slush bucket and a brush. I haven't got the brains enough to be a pilot. And if I did, I wouldn't have the strength enough to carry him around unless I went on crutches. All right, now drop that. I tell a man I'll learn him the river. I mean it. You can depend on it. I'll learn it. Or I'll kill him.
There's a picture, isn't it? The river. Well, I could put a frame around that and hang it on the wall just about anywhere. That's what you call romantic. At least the passengers would. Time wise, I would have too. Not lately. The river's starting to appear different. Mr. Bixby's seeing to that. At sunset now. I used to glory in one like that. Looking at it now, I just wonder if the color of it means a high wind tomorrow. Or rain. That lonesome old tree with one green branch on it just fighting to stay alive. I was put there to be admired, but I have to consider that it's about to rot and fall over. And how's a body to get through this blind spot without it as a landmark? A streak on the water, the shadow of the forest. It's like a painter had put that there just to make it look pretty. I mean, I know what it really is. It's the break from a new snag that set itself in the best place to fish for steam. Boat. Oh, beauty's fine, Mr. Eel, and I'm all for it, but it just seems to me there's a mighty high discount on it along the Mississippi River. Not a pilot going, boy. Hasn't pondered all that. Doesn't sometimes wonder whether he's gained most or most of my learn this tree. So how long do you reckon we're gonna be made up here, Richard? Don't know. <laughs> as long as it takes to fit a new connection right into that lava at entrance. Then why do you suppose Bixby wants to see you? Blessed if I know. I'm sure to be corrected for something. Sometimes I think I was just Better off in school. Don't seem to be any end to the lessons. Does seem so. Hey, whatever he charges you with, the best thing is to hint that it was somebody else who done it, and that you'd take the blame before you'd snitch on the guilty party. Plan his house down there. I'm going fishing. Hey, get around, get around. You, boy! M Mr. Brown. You're, uh, Bigsby's cub, ain't you? Yes, sir. Well, now, it's like this. I just got me a berth on the Anna Louise here to Cairo. Need someone who's fresh off the run below Goose Island. How'd you like to come steer for me? You mean leave Mr. Bigsby? He paying you wages? Well, no, sir. He took me on to learn the river. Well, sir, supposing I was to pay you 50 cents a week with a line and thrown in free gratis. Get your new shoes. Treat you like you was my own son. Now, how's that for handsome? I signed to an agreement. I can't go against that. Hey, why not? Bigsby treats you that royal, does he? I'm not saying that. I got an obliged to him. He's always played it square with me, and I just ain't about to let him down. I wouldn't work alongside anyone who thought I would. Well, don't get uppish with me, you little whelp. You doddurned insolent sprat. I ain't forgetting you. It's a big river, but it ain't so big we won't meet on it. And the day we do, you'll wish it was the day before, I promise you that. Back in 53, coming through the chute behind Big Indian Island, 
Like the mill tail of thunder, don't you know? And all of a sudden, I struck a snag. It come through my hull, just missed my boiler, and come out through my engineer's hat. You don't believe it? Show him, Ben. If she'd have struck my brains, dang if I wouldn't have been a pilot today. <laughs> Where's that waiter? I'll be dinged if he ain't ah, there you the are, Mr. Bixby. When it comes to slow, the bell ain't even in. Papers. Remember the John J. Rowe? She raced with an <laughs> island once and lost. <laughs> Why, she was so pokey. When she finally sank, it was five years before the owners found out about it. <laughs> There's a yarn won't stand up to probate. Oh, gospel fact. I had the document to prove it. Speaking of racing, I ever tell you the time on the eclipse when we raced the shot well? That's the time you threw all your wood overboard to lighten the boat and burn your saloon furniture instead? <laughs> it's the paint and varnish on it does the trick. Yes, sir, for going full bell, you got to make sparks. And a little fire is quickly trodden out. That's written down in Henry VI. Well, that don't make a bit of sense. Say that again. Me and Mr. Shakespeare don't chew our cabbage twice. <laughs> <laughs> Fact is, in racing, it ain't the weight that signifies. It's your balance. I recall one race, you wouldn't believe what we did to keep that boat in trim. Astonish us, Mr. Ealer. Why, everyone on the wheel watch had to stand in line behind each other, dead center in the pilot house, and we all had our hair parted in the middle with a spirit level. <laughs> Something happened? I'm leaving the Paul Jones, boy. What? Why? Well, I just signed with Captain Kleinfelder. I'm going on the Alex Scott. The Alex Scott? Well, that's Mr. Thornburg's boat. No, it's mine, too, now. I swapped first with her other pilot, and we're leaving Friday. Oh. Well, now, what's that? I thought you would be delighted with my fortune. That boat is the finest boat on the lower Mississippi for her size and fast. Why, she can do 17 miles to the hour going down river and haul the Paul Jones besides. Is that a fact? That's a fact. And elegant. Why, she would make the prettiest boat on the anchor line look like a floating cook stove. Why, you ought to see her wheelhouse. Real china doorknobs, red window curtains, great big brass cuspidors the size of fire buckets. Why, she would just naturally make a man go out and learn how to spell the word splendiferous so that he could write home about it. I see. Of course, you'll be needing somebody to steer for you, won't you? How's that? Oh. Oh. Yes, I expect I will, but I... Uh... Can't just be an anybody, no, sir. Not, not I, a large majority, not this boat. What the Alex Scott needs is a steersman who is copper lined and double riveted and gilt edged besides. I mean, nothing less than that's going to do. I'm sure there's some of them about. Mm -hmm. Of course, he doesn't have to be too smart. I mean, just any darn fool will serve. I don't suppose you'd like to apply. Me? You mean it? <laughs> <laughs> and you had me thinking. What, that I'd leave you on the dark? Well, then you are an extraordinary dirt fool, and I ought to leave you. Glory, I'll be steering on a real New Orleans packet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. Life on the Mississippi will continue after a one minute intermission. This special presentation in the humanities is made possible by grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, John Deere Company, Exxon Corporation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations.
We now continue with Life on the Mississippi, Part 2. are well removed from all machinery. And our boilers are furnished with patented safety valves. We shall be quite safe. It's just that we should not like to explode. Not with any lifeboats. I trust it is not your intention, Captain, to indulge in any racing. On my honor, madam. Come along. Ah, Mr. and Mrs. James Thurlow, and niece, Miss De Beverly. Well, I make you manners. Uh, Captain Kleinfelter, I realize that on a public vessel one must uh, rub elbows. Uh, but I, I do hope that there is some gentility aboard. The most refined society, I assure you, madam. Uh, Ah, welcome aboard. How do you do? There you are, sir. Horace Bixby, licensed pilot, all official and as advertised. Very handsome indeed. Sorry I'm late, Mr. Bixby. I've been seeing Richie and Miss Reela off on the Paul Jones. Oh, that's all right. You're timely enough, boy. Besides, Mr. Thornburg and I will be standing the first watch together. So we won't be needing your valuable assistance until we're well underway. Oh, fine, well, I'll just, I'll just sit here on the lazy bench then. I can if you want to. Uh, to have you met uh, Mr. Thornburg's cub yet? Tom, just now. Oh, only to say how do, though. Well, why don't you two roosters go on and get acquainted? Boris, get out. Get out of here. Right smart of a lad there, Horace. Yeah, well, so is your time, I hear. Makes you wonder, though, if we aren't bringing too many into the trade. What? Mark my words, too many pilots to bring wages down. There's more in the river now than there are birds for. Well, now, I hear tell that the government is building a brand new river. Just to accommodate them. On the river long, have you? For well, some while now. Been more than a year. Just old Bixby, eh? Yeah, that's right. Old Thornburg's my second chief. Yep, steered for Mr. John Seegers first. Thank you. Vicksburg to St. Louis. 
Diana, side wheeler. <clears throat> Old Seegers. Always had a big jaw up here. <laughs> oh, he was an expectorating wonder. I'd pull down the wheel, he'd spit through the spoke, hit either chimney. Said he could tell by the sound of the sizzle just how much pressure was down the boilers. Well, that's a fearful good spit. Yeah, how's he on pilot? Oh, first rate and a half. Not a patch in old Thornburg, though. Oh, there's the best in the river. Oh, your man's all right in his line, I expect. Well, now, but... now, just you hold on. I mean, good enough isn't the word for Mr. Bixby. Why, it don't even begin. Well, he's the best pilot since old Noah himself. <clears throat> well, who was it that was second pilot on the Princess when she ran from New Orleans to Natchez in 17 hours and 30 minutes? Horace Bixby, that's who. Yeah, some call him Low Water Thornburg. Not just face course. That's on account of the time he took the Sally Henry straight across the turbo that she told you swamp. Dogged if he didn't. Three inches of mud water, and just enough bullfrogs for the wheel to get a hold on. Oh, he was famous for that, all right. Well, I shouldn't wonder. Although, anybody knows that there's lots of swamps that's boatable. Now, what really takes some doing is piloting where there ain't no water at all. Now, there's a wonder I'd like to hear about. Well, now, I'm surprised you haven't. The whole thing come about when this boat got itself stranded up two miles up a dry creek. It was took there by a flash flood. And the first thing the company does is to hire Horace Bixby to get it down. The first thing Mr. Bixby does is to advertise in all the papers for the most sorrowful woman in the country. Oh, and didn't she show up? Oh, she was blubbering away like a rusted boiler. Yeah, her nose was all red from sniffing and sobbing. Who was she crying about? She had married a man with seven children and a hundred creditors. And she went and inherited all of them when he ran off with the pretty lady circus rider. I wouldn't say that this woman owned the U.S. federal patent on crying, but all the improvements must have been in her name. Oh, she was a champion. What does that have to do with the stranded steamboat? I'll tell you. Now, first thing Mr. Bixby does to set that woman right down on top of the fantail, just above the stern wheel, told her to cry away like all creation. Of course, he was paying her by the bucket full, but uh, just to make sure, he had the mate standing up alongside her, singing sad songs to keep her primed. Now, that creek bed was as dry as sunstruck bone. Didn't old Horace Bixby back that boat for two miles on the tears of a weeping woman? I reckon we ain't known each other long enough for me to call you a liar. Tom, you are too smart for me by half. <laughs> Danged if you ain't caught me out. <laughs> well, the truth is, that boat never did get back to the river. It appears that the mate got to singing Methodist hymns and so cheered up that woman that she stopped crying and couldn't manage another sob at double the going price. And old Mr. Bixby had to go on without her assistance. Which he did, of course. And I didn't I tell you that was a dry creek? Well, the paddle wheel turned up so much dust that he couldn't see where he was going. And at the first crossing, he got lost. And dang, if he didn't ground that boat, bang in the middle of a pasture lot. Well, that's OK, see, because next heavy rain comes by, it'll turn that lot into a swamp. And then your Mr. Thornburg can get her out. Hey, how are you wrestling? She has earned, she has repented, and through three years her conduct has been so far beyond reproach that even the piercing eye of Calumet cannot discern a single spot upon this radiant orb. No, never. My husband's honor is sacred to me. I love him unutterably, but never, never can I be his wife again, even if he were generous enough to pardon me. In this world, then, we have no more to say. Forget a wretch who will never forget you. 
Let me press this hand to my lips once more. This hand that once was mine. When we again Say all that for me, will you? Fair and they to be again be mine. just have to thank you kindly. Mercy, you must think me a perfect noodle. I was just so taken up with my silly sketching. My name is Emmeline de Beverly. I've been visiting my relations in the environs of St. Louis, although I reside in Plaquemines, Paris, Louisiana. Tom Greeley, miss. And my home is on the broad, dark reaches of the Mississippi. My, you do talk fancy. My aunt and uncle are escorting me to New Orleans, Raman Road and Miss Marion's female academy. Well, maybe I could show you and your party around the boat sometime. Interesting parts that the passengers don't generally see. Right, happy to do that. Yes, ma'am. Well, I have to ask Auntie, but it might provide some amusing subjects for my pencil. Not that I have a snap attendant whatsoever. But my goodness, that picture's a stunner. You got the river right down to the life. Mighty handsome, yes, ma'am. I found you Paisley, dear. You must have... Now, Emmeline, remember what I said? Prudence and propriety. Courtesy to the passengers, ma'am. Policy of the line. I'm an officer on the boat. One of the assistant pilots. <clears throat> He's another one. Come along, like bombshells. Look at them crossways and... Boom. How are we fixed for wood, Ben? Sure, that's all. Then there was a time the Diana, we got hit by a hurricane. Blew away both chimneys and the pot spectacles. And with the smoke pouring out of the two holes in the deck, he couldn't see for beans. Take over, Tom, he says. Well, and have my hands full. There was nothing like a hurricane to put Scoot into a steamboat. Wind blew us into St. Louis two days ahead of time. My company was so high pleased. There was talk presenting me with a horn handle. Silver steel pocket knife. I'd hate to think that all those stories he told me were meant to deceive. About his heroic deeds and everything. Oh, I know just how you feel. It would change my high opinion of human nature. What's that? It's the sorrowful remains of the great wake robin. Run aground on an alligator reef. Alligator reef? Mm. Ripped the hole right out from under. You can see how in that terrible rage they chewed at a flint of jigs. All that's left is the pilot house. They're working on that right now. If you listen real carefully, you can hear it. Now you are too bad by far. I suppose you're going to tell me you were on that boat when it happened. 
But if I did, then I'd be deceiving you. Just like Tom. No, I won't stretch the truth, and seven men kicking me with copper-toed boots couldn't make me. Oh, the wake robin was wrecked long before I even went on the river. All I ever did was hear about it. That was when I had my first birth. Deckhand. An alligator boat. Whatever is an alligator boat? To dredge out alligators with. They're not so thick now as to be troublesome. The government keeps them down. They used to be. They have their favorite places, like here, where the river's wide and shoal. I should think that dredging out the alligators wouldn't do much good, because they'd come back again right away. Well, now, if you had as much experience with alligators as I did, you wouldn't be talking like that. You dredge an alligator once, and he's convinced. It's the last you hear of him. He wouldn't come back with pie. He wouldn't. Not hardly. But if there's one thing an alligator's more down on than another, it's being dredged. With the individual articles, no problem. It's when they get together in job lots and form an association, that's when they got to be dredged. Well, we used to scoop them up, freight them out to Orleans, where they got a government works. Well, what's done with them there? Well, they're made into soldier shoes. They're hides. The driest shoes in the world. You ever heard of a waterlogged alligator? No, and I doubt that anyone else has either. That's why alligators is government property. It was a $50 fine for killing one. Lucky duck, they don't hang you, too. See, it's kind of like the, the buzzard is the sacred bird of the South, and you can't touch him. The alligator is, is the sacred bird of the government, and he just got to leave him alone. Some Sounds like supper. I could eat a sow and six pigs. Pretty soon now. Composition, wasn't it, Captain? Fine, Tim. Captain? Not surprising, sir. Fella wrote it. His brother's well known in the river trade. Foster. Gunning Foster. Captain of the James Mulligan. And I do confess feeling right brickly about you. And Tom, too. Thinking as I did, all those stories you told were nothing but fibs. Only I don't anymore. You don't? Not after I spoke to Mr. Bixby about the alligator dredging, and he told me the truth. He said it was even more dangerous than you described. And that you were kindly sparing my tender sensibilities. He said, through all the perils of the river, the alligator reef was the most feared by all. Boy, got a slam. Why don't you go on up and relieve the watch? I'll be along with you directly as soon as I destroy more of this turkey. You'll be all right till I get there. Well, I reckon. But don't you rush yourself, Mr. Bixby. You can stay right through the pie. Everything will be fine up there. Uh, Miss Emmeline, would you care to assist me? Felter, I distinctly said that my party was temperance. Now, why have we been served spirit? That's water, Mrs. Thurlow. From a cistern? Oh, no, sir. From the river. Mrs. Thurlow, may I please? <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Took on about Cape Girardeau by the color of them. Yeah. It takes longer to clarify than down here, but it repays the effort. Now, you can sip it off the top as it settles. Of course, if you prefer more sustenance, you might stir it up a little bit there. It makes a first class brew. Oh, waiter. I'll have some cider. Oh, unfermented. Very good now. You told her steady, son. All of her jack staff straight down to Mississippi. That's all there is to her. Aye, aye, sir. My sakes! Body must have to be mighty strong just to turn that wheel. Down river, a fella could do a one-hander. Sometimes the current will hold the rudder up against the hull. And then it takes two men to pull it down. And one just to holler encouraging words. Why is this boat so pokey? I declare, can't you make it go any faster? It's easy enough. But pile on too much steam, you can bust the boilers. Blow her sky high, us with her. Change your snaps. Of course, if you're scared. All right, Ben, put the kettle on and let it boil. If it would be possible, Captain, to do without all those disturbing whistles and bells. We suddenly seem to have accelerated. Why is that, Captain? Well, uh, well. We're racing another boat, aren't we? Oh, I tell you, the machinery will explode and we'll all be. I knew it, but this boat is a volcano. Compose yourself, madam. Mr. Bixby here. What's that young man doing? Dang the find though. I told him to hold us steady. No, 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 hold it, hold it. He's slowing down. Going full bell like that, he could have fetched up on a towhead. He's showing off to that little missy's what he's doing. <sighs> Mr. Thornburg, I've got me a cub who thinks he's a master pilot. Have you noticed that? I hadn't wanted to say anything, Mr. Bixby, but he has been a mite bit chesty. Yeah, well, I reckon I'm gonna have to do something about that. Tonight? No. No, I've got me a better idea. Tomorrow, second watch, we ought to be coming up on Island 66. You know that stretch? I can run it with my eyes shut. Mm -hmm. How much water do you think is in there? Well, that's an odd question. You know, you couldn't get bottom with a church steeple. No bottom, huh? Why, if there was a market for deep water, you could sell that stretch for enough money to buy Yes, Mr. Thornburg. Isn't that shoal water ahead? No, sir. There can't be, sir. Well, I don't see it. It can't be. Landsman! I didn't call for any lab. No, but um. What a train! What? No, but, um... Mark Twain. 
Jane. trick to play in an orphan. I don't expect I'll ever hear the last of this. Well? No, you won't. I never did. Mr. Ehler never did. Mr. Leathers never did. Brown never did. Mr. Beacon never did. Backer Ben, if you love me. <laughs> 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 Say, my dogs, you chuckheaded old gully jumper. Yeah, well, at least I ain't growed ugly like you, you old swamper. <laughs> <laughs> Say, how are you? Where's the Bob Jones? We just landed. Took us three days longer than you. Of course, we didn't get held up at Island 66. <laughs> <laughs> that story must have been on the telegraph. What are you doing with that? I figured to do some steering on the Alex Scott. You don't say. So you'll be steering for Thornburg then. <laughs> ain't that fine? Guess you ain't heard. Old Thornburg's off the Alex Scott this trip. Well, what's up? Seems the first class pilots is forming up a benevolent association to protect their rights and draw papers and stuff. They want Thornburg in on the deliberations. Well, who's your new chief to be then? Mr. Ela. A proper man is one shall see in a summer's day. Bill Shakespeare was referring to another party, but. It serves to say how do you under all circumstances, lad. Oh, just wait till I tell old Bixby. Old Bixby already knows it. I want to have a word with you. You heard about the new Pilots Association. Just now. Well, they want me to be in on it. So I'll be leaving the boat with Mr. Thornburg. Now, the owners have hired another pilot to take my place for the rest of the trip. You didn't have to steer for someone else? But I'm article to you. So you have been, but of course the government requires two signatures on your pilot's license anyway. Well, who's my new pilot to be? Well now, if it ain't Bigsby's cub. Only we're Brown's cub now, ain't we? Are you going to sit there all day? I've had no orders, sir. You've had no orders. My, what a fine bird we are. 
We must have orders. Oh, our father was a gentleman, owned slaves, and we've been to school. Oh, yes, we are a gentleman by seed, breed, and generation, no doubt. I didn't say that, sir. And I didn't notice that. That kind of putty don't stick with me. God turn my skin orders, is it? I'll learn you not to swell yourself up and blow around here about your goddamn orders and get away from my wheel. Now, what are you standing there for? Take that ice pitcher down to the Texas tender. Uh, excuse me, he's gone ashore for the day. You don't say so. Well, now, a real gold leaf kid glove steersman like you should be able to find the pantry by himself. Move along, goddamn it! I'll learn you to jump lively if you expect my name on your certificate. Sit there like you paid your passage, didn't you? Here, take the wheel. Yes, sir. What did you say? I said, yes, sir, sir. I hear you. Don't come any of your darned insolence on me. Where in the nation you going to? Pull her down, pull her down. What, are you going to hold her down all day? Let her go, meet her, meet her. If you ain't slower in real estate, Dernedest numbskull I ever saw. You ain't got sense enough to steer a plow. You're on my watch now. You got to do what I say. Snatch her! Snatch her! Hey, where are you going now? You're gonna run over that snag? Pull her down! Pull her down! Just as I expected. There she goes. I told you not to cramp that reef. Get away from that doddurn wheel. wanted to see if you had the gumption enough to round it. What did I tell you? Half circle, didn't I? And you're pointing us a mile above the land. You did it a purpose just to gravel me, didn't you? No, sir. Oh, then you should be thrown on the county for a doctor idiot. If you ain't the original lack-witted, chicken-hearted ninny hammer, you ought to be pitched in the river till the real one comes on board. <laughs> By the eternal, you'll do what I told you, or I'll give it to Harry, I promise you. Still writing down the river. Not this trip, Richie. I'm setting down all the different satisfying ways I can think of of murdering old Brown. Haven't I stayed up nights over it? Sam, uh, I don't say he wouldn't improve a whole lot with killing, but how many ways you thought of? Well, let's see. Uh, putting together disembowelment and asphyxiation makes it 16 so far. <laughs> By jings, you are right there when it comes to doing away with villains. Uh, all the same, writing it down like that, I'd use a secret code, just in case somebody discovered it. Evidence. Of what? I haven't done him in yet. Yeah, well, pilots ain't just ordinary villains. But there's all sorts of special government laws only for them. But just for laying a hand on a pilot, never mind killing one while he's performing his duty, you put in the penitentiary without even and asking how you feel about it. Wait, I've got it. Okay, how about if I was to drive him up to his chin into the deck with a big sledge and then pull him out with a claw hammer? Seventeen. Stay clear of the pilot house, you don't get this What's the matter, Henry? What happened? It was Mr. Brown, sir. What did he do? I was sent on an errand for the captain. He sent me up to ask the pilot if he'd order up more steam, please. Well, 
I told him. But maybe he didn't hear me. So I said it louder. That made him mad. And he shied that at me. It would have hit me hadn't I dodged. I'm scared of Mr. Brown. So am I. Why ain't you up there with Mr. Euler? <clears throat> what are you up to? Huh? Uh, just packing my satchel. I thought I'd maybe... <clears throat> Truth is, I'm going ashore at first light. I'm going to wait for my boat there. What boat? What happened? My license come through. Uh, Mr. Ela fixed it up with the company to, uh, to get me a berth on the Paul Jones. Second pilot, just soon as I can join up with her. See that? That's real fine. You might have told a fella. Oh, I've been wanting to. Truth is, I didn't know how. I, I figured you'd feel bad. Me getting my license. And going off on our old boat and all. <laughs> Me? Are you old pudding head? I had to pound you just for thinking that. Are you waiting till I get my own boat? Anytime you want, I'll race you, beat you too. Buy a dinner if I don't. <laughs> you watch out for old Brown. The captain, sir, asked to feel cross over Don't to the Don't tell me when to wood up, don't you? I know to the stick how much wood is left. Stop, turn, meddler. Treat me like I never piloted a boat before. After all these years. Mr. Brown? Huh? You too? What do you want? Only that the mud clerk was... Think I'm blind, don't you? And I don't hold with chattering in the pilot house. Now, you just sit there till you're spoke to. But I... Hold your jaw, I said. Mr. Brown, didn't Henry carry my message? You were to look for a hail at Jones Plantation. Was I now? <laughs> well, first I heard of it. I sent him up to tell you. He did come up, and that's all the good he done, the goddamn fool. He never said anything. Didn't you hear him? Well, well yes, sir. Shut your mouth. You never heard anything of the kind. Scotty, you! Why didn't you tell me I was to watch for a hail? I did tell you. It's a lie! You lie yourself. He did tell you. I'll attend to your case in half a minute. Come back here, you little stutter! You little whelp! I'm what? 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 
brain me, you goddamn devil. Assault and bodily harm. Murder and attack. That's what I'll charge you with. Oh, won't I, though? Prison for life, you butter faced pup. Give over that wheel, Doctor, and you. Ah, a forcible interference. Pilot on duty. And that goes on the account, too. See if it don't. I'll give you a taste of my quality you will never forget. I have tasted all of your qualities that I care to. You're a miserable, ignorant, malicious, fault finding moot knight and fine old tyrant. And not only that, you use dangling participles and double negatives. And for a firing no roarer, you don't even know how to cuss right. Now you can have your old steamboat back, dog darn ya! Fighting, Mr. Brown? Yes, sir. Do you know that that is a very serious matter? Yes, sir. Are you aware that this boat was plowing up the river fully five minutes with no one at the wheel? Yes, sir. Did you strike him first? Yes, sir. What with? A stool, sir. A stool. Hard? Midland, sir. Did you do anything further? Yes, yeah, sir. What did you do? Pounded him, sir. Did you pound him much? That is, severely? One could say that, I suppose, yes, sir. <laughs> mention that I said that. You've been guilty of a great crime, and don't you ever let it again happen on this boat. But lay for him ashore. Give him a good sound thrashing. I'll pay the expenses. Now go. Be off with you. You've been guilty of a great crime, you whelp. Well, I reckon you fixed his flint. The matter has been resolved, Mr. Brown. Good. I hope he's been landed by sundown, because I'll never turn a dud-dern wheel on this boat again while that cub stays. He needn't come around while you're on watch. I won't stay on the same boat with him. One of us has got to go ashore. Very well. Young sir, a word with you, if you please. Thanks to your high spirit, this boat now has only one pilot. So, until your Mr. Bixby can rejoin us, I think it would be proper if you would volunteer not only to steer for Mr. Ela, but to take over whichever of his watches he might consider prudent. Don't you agree? Uh, yes, Captain. Uh, Considering all the trouble that I've caused, I reckon that's only fair. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, sir. Just a thing for a night like this. <clears throat> Getting cold and charity out there. Did you see that up ahead? It looked like a steamboat. Just around the bend. Sure was making spots. Must have heard our whistle and was trying to stay ahead of us. Wonder why. Oh, likely she wants to beat us to the next landing. Looking to grab a cargo before we do. I don't take kindly to anyone beating us out. I thought we scoot right past them. Ben? How about a little more? Come ahead, Honor. Hey, Mr. 
Bigsby? I take note you're standing your own watch. Yeah, well, you would. It would be. I heard about Mr. Brown. I heard about the Paul Jones, too. That's. It's hard news. It's grievous hard. Truth to tell, I didn't know whether you'd still be aboard. Uh, out, it's still on the river. I'd, uh, I hope so. Somebody once told me hope so has got no place on the river. Comrades and I had one permanent ambition to be a steamboat man. Boy after boy, I managed to get on the river. By and by, I ran away too. Said I could never come home until I was a pilot. I'd come home in glory. I tell you, I love this profession. I take a measureless pride in it. For a pilot on a steamboat is the only unfettered, entirely independent human being to walk the face of the earth. Well, she cuts her own course to the river. There's a glory to her. I mean, she'll, she'll take a man any place a man ought to go. She'll kill you, too, if you give her half a chance. I mean to die at the wheel of a steamboat. You know, where are you going? Start my crossing. No, no. It's too soon. You start your crossing after the point up there. That was three weeks ago. The river's been making up since then. Easy waters now, right here where them stumps are. You think so, do you? I know so. 